All right. Well, good morning, Docs Church. Guys, it is... uh, It's great to see you guys. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, you're new. My name is Rob. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, Doxa. It's great to have you part of the the Doxa family gathering today. But for all you dads out there, happy Father's Day. Can you make some noise for the dads? So uh, here's here's what I want to do. Okay, one of our core values here at Doxa is honor. And so to honor literally means to recognize as significant or special. And so we honor God with our lives. We also honor one another. And so if you are a a dad or a to be dad, can you go ahead and just stand up so we can recognize you? And I know all you introverts are like, I'm not doing it. I see, I see you thinking about it. Just stand up. But, but dads, before you, before you sit down, I know some of you are itching to sit down. Before you sit down and we open up the Bible, let me just uh, say this, okay? Guys, Father's Day reminds us that just being a dad is a really high calling. And, and men, I just want to remind you uh, today that, you know, before God asked you to father anybody, he wants to be your father. And he has made a way through Jesus. And so one of the best things that we can do is to live, live our lives with Jesus at the forefront, loving him more than we love our kids, more than we love our spouses, more than we love anything or anyone. And so today is really a day for, for you as dads and me as a dad to like feel like seen and loved and honored by our kids. But it's also a day that should just make us feel like kind of the, the weight of our calling. And so dads, as, as one dad speaking to many, let me just say this. Here's been my prayer for, for us as dads here at Doxa. Like, let's just run the race well and love God, okay? Like, God has, like, uniquely placed you in a place where you are the only man that can be the father to your kids, uniquely. And the best thing that we can do is to really just help them to set the pace for our family, to set the pace for our kids in loving Jesus and loving people, spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer. And this is not something that we're going to be able to do on our own, but we're going to have to look to God through the presence and the power of his Holy Spirit. And so in those times where we fail to image like the love of the Father and we lose it with our kids, which I, know, I don't know, I do that a lot, but if you don't do that, good on you and whatever. But anyway, when we do that, let's, let's be the type of men that we're quick to repent and quick to apologize to our kids and our families and turn to Jesus because, guys, this is the best model that we could, we could do. And so I love you guys. I'm honored to walk with Jesus alongside of you. And so to help us to become like the men that God has created us to be, we got you a gift. So make sure you stop by the rock wall. It's a, it's a book that's significantly uh, shaped my life and it's short. So I thought you guys would appreciate that, but grab one of those on your way out is just a gift for us just to say happy father's day. But before you sit down, let me just pray for you and uh, we'll get going. Okay. So father, we love you. And even as we celebrate Father's Day, God, I'm so thankful that you are a good father. And God, I I pray for those in this room that are, yeah, in a situation like me, not having an earthly dad, or maybe having a dad that the relationship is strained, or maybe they lost their dad recently, or there's dads here that maybe have lost their kids, and God, this could be a mixed day of feeling like really celebratory, but also really heavy, and so Holy Spirit, you say that you are a comforter and a helper. Um, Comfort those who are hurting today. And for the dads standing up in this room, God, I pray that you would just help us. Help us to live like Jesus, live for Jesus. Help us to love people, help us to love our kids. We can't do it on our own, and so we look to you as our helper. And so empower us to live like Jesus for your glory, the good of our families, and the good of the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. One more time for the dads. All right, so guys, go ahead and grab your Bible. All right, we are in Mark chapter 8 today. If you're new, we're kind of just journeying through the gospel according to Mark, looking at the historical man Jesus, and really kind of asking the question of like, so what? Like, what does this mean for us? But we're in Mark chapter 8, and as you get there, let me just start with this. I'm not sure if you've realized or not, but for the last two Sundays, I haven't been here, okay? Uh, I was in Colorado for a while speaking at a student camp, and then I shot down to New Orleans to be part of this conference with a bunch of church leaders from around the country. But in Colorado, you know, I was, I was speaking to a bunch of students from a church in Arlington, Texas, and I love this church, okay? I, I love uh, the pastor. He's become a really good friend. This church has 
been super generous to our church. So uh, they've been supporting Salt Company over the last five years and they gave really, really generously back in 2018 and still do that to help us get started here in Madison. But this is a great church and I've spoken at their student camp for the last several summers. But last week there was uh, this student that came up to me crying after a session and He's like the really cool kid, you know, he's got like beautiful hair and just really good looking. Everybody wants to be like him. And honestly, over the last couple of years, he's been like really un- disengaged, like just not caring about anything that I'm saying. So I've noticed him. And so when he came up to me crying, I was like actually pretty surprised to see him that way. But he asked if he could talk to me. And so we went off to the side and I just asked him, I'm like, what's up? And I was pretty positive. I'm like, okay, he's, he's sleeping with his girlfriend or addicted to pornography or something like that. He's just going to confess some sin to me. But I, I looked to him and, and I was like, what's up, man? And he just barely able to speak through his tears. He looked at me and he said, I finally see it. I see him. Like, I get it. And he just said, thank you. And just gave me like a really big hug that lasted way too long. Okay. <laughs> so, but we talked for a while. We, we prayed for a bit after that. And he kind of told me a little bit of his story and he grew up in the church, obviously in Texas, the Bible Belt. He's heard about Jesus for as long as he can remember. He's been to a lot of different camps through the summers. And so he knew a lot about the Bible, but it didn't mean that much to him. And in his words, he said he could see, but he really couldn't see in a way that helped him to understand. But that night we were talking about, I was teaching through 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and he said in his words, the lights just kind of came on. And he finally saw Jesus for who he is. And that night he stood up in front of all of his peers and he just raised his hand and said, I need Jesus. And he put his faith in Jesus and he was just overcome with thankfulness and and love and was just like losing it. And guys, it's moments like that that I love. You know, but as I've been thinking about this kid and praying for this kid and thinking about his story, guys, for years, right, he could see but really not enough to understand. That he had partial sight, but was partially spiritually blind. But when his eyes were kind of opened up and he could see who Jesus really is and who, what Jesus truly gives, guys, everything changed for him. Has that happened to anybody in this room? Guys, this is what I want you to see, guys. This is the issue happening in Mark chapter eight. All right, so as we get into chapter eight, Mark is over halfway through his three, or Jesus is over halfway through his three-year ministry. And as he's been teaching, he's been traveling around, he's, he's teaching, he's loving, he's serving, he's doing miracles. People are seeing him, but they're seeing him in a way that they don't really understand. That the crowds that we've been hearing about throughout this gospel, they're seeing Jesus. These Jewish leaders, they're seeing Jesus. And even his disciples, they're seeing him but they're not really seeing Jesus for who he actually is. And this is what chapter eight is all about. And in verse 22, as we find the beginning of a significant shift in Jesus's ministry, all right, that Jesus basically says, hey, I'm done trying to convince the crowds. I'm done trying to convince all of the Jews that I am in fact the Messiah. I'm done trying to teach them about my identity in my gospel. And what he's doing now is he has set his eyes on Jerusalem. He set his eyes on the cross. He's marching towards his death in Jerusalem with his disciples and he's teaching them. And he's really just teaching them all that they need to know before he dies. And so what we're gonna learn today is the primary things. There's so many things that we could know, but what we're gonna learn today is the primary things that we all need to know about how we live our lives and who Jesus is. Is. And this is where we're going to see starting in verse 22. So Mark chapter 8, we'll start in verse 22. And here's what it says. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened up his eyes. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. I want you to underline that in your Bible. He saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Okay, so here's what's going on. 
Jesus has just gotten through like a conf- confrontation with some of the religious leaders who were coming at him, kind of demanding that he do these signs and wonders, these miracles, but Jesus just kind of respectfully like refuses. He takes his disciples, they left this place, they crossed to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, where he's about to teach his disciples an important lesson about spiritual sight. That as we've been watching the crowds, as we've been watching the Jewish religious leaders through Mark to this point, guys, we've seen that they have hard hearts that has kept them from Jesus. They're, they're very prideful. This goes back to the early on in the gospel of Mark where Jesus tells the parable of the soils. He, we're seeing a lot of people with hard hearts. And what this is, is doing is it's instead of them seeing Jesus and being enthralled by Jesus and wanting to follow him, these men and women that are part of the crowds, these leaders, they're missing who he truly is. They're missing the fact that he is God. They're missing the fact that he is the Messiah. And so rather than following him and loving him and worshiping them, they, he, they just hate him and they reject him. These are the crowds, these are religious leaders. But if you look back, look back to verses 17, 18, and 21. It wasn't just the crowds. It'd be easy to throw the stones at the crowds and the religious leaders. But if we look at these verses, it appears the disciples were actually almost as blind as the Pharisees that they're seeing Jesus but not fully, that they saw in part but they still didn't really understand, just like that kid at camp. He was around Jesus a lot. He heard about Jesus, he saw Jesus, but he really didn't understand it in a way that changed anything about his life. And so as they arrive at this place called Bethsaida, all right, Jesus does a miracle, but in a way that the miracle becomes a visual parable to teach his disciples an important lesson about seeing. And if you look, this is like a two-step process, right, that Jesus does here. And this is different from any of his other ministries. And and many people that are kind of more in the prosperity gospel realm will take this idea of like a two-process thing and say, well, if we pray for healing, that means it just didn't work just like Jesus. And so we got to keep going and going and going. But I want you to know, it's not that Jesus like ran out of power. He didn't have a power shortage here, all right? He didn't have a malfunction, anything like that. But guys, this was very intentional because Jesus is portraying the gradual step-by-step process for the disciples of seeing for understanding. Because in this moment, guys, Jesus could have healed this man instantly. No sweat, it would have been light work. But he doesn't do that because he's trying to help the disciples to come to see and understand that they are still partially blind to who he is. That they're very much like this blind man who receives his sight gradually. And guys, I'll tell you, this was my story. Like I I started seeing Jesus in the sense of I did Bible studies with guys in the locker room in college and I would see him, but not really see him. I would be intrigued by like, what's going on here? This was a story of of this kid in Colorado. And guys, I'll be honest, I think it's probably likely that this is the story of some of you in this room today. And I've been praying, even as I walked up here on the stage, that this would be the day that Jesus just lays his hands on your eyes and that you can actually see him for who he is because this will change everything about your life. But in this situation, if you look back, some friends bring a blind man to Jesus for help and healing. All right? and, and no doubt, these friends, they've, they've heard about Jesus' compassion, they've heard and maybe even seen his ability to do crazy things, and they believed that man, if we could just get our friend to Jesus, like Jesus can help him. And, and let me just pause and just, just say this for a second. Guys, this is a great thing for us to consider as a church family. Because as I was reading about this and just thinking about the, these friends that bring their, friends, their friend to Jesus, these are the types of friends that I pray that Doxa Church is filled with. Do you understand that the kingdom of God doesn't grow and the gospel doesn't go to people primarily by us throwing about a big service with awesome worship and awesome music and all right teaching. Do you know that? This is not the primary methodology that God uses to grow the kingdom, but the kingdom grows and people meet Jesus by friends of Jesus, Christians going out, living in their everyday stuff of life as gospel friends towards the people around them. This is how the gospel goes forward. It's not this, guys. If this is like your view of what it means to be a Christian, I'm so glad that you're here. Please keep coming because I think God is gonna blow that up and give you a whole new view of what it actually means to follow him and live like him. But my prayer is that our church would be filled with people 
who are like these friends. Men and women that are not wrapped up in religion, but men and women who love Jesus and love people. Like men and women who have enough love and compassion and perspective and courage to bring our friends to Jesus, knowing that Jesus is the one who we all need above anything and everything in this world. Because these friends, they just wanted to help their friend and the best thing that they could do, they're like, we gotta help our friend. I think the best thing we could do is just get him to Jesus. We need to bring him to Jesus. And I want you to know the truth, Doxa, that we will never be disappointed when we bring our friends to Jesus, and neither will they. And so let's live our lives like these friends, bringing our friends to Jesus for their joy and God's glory, amen? Okay, now, that really had nothing to do with anything. That was just because I love you, but that's not even the point of this, okay? But if you look back, Jesus takes this blind man by the hand, all right? He asked him if he could, he spit on his eyes, he asked him if he could see anything. And again, Jesus didn't expect like complete healing at this point because he's using it to teach his disciples and help this guy. But the man responds, yeah, I can see a little bit better than before, but I still can't see clearly. And so then Jesus lays his hands on this man's eyes and then his sight returns perfectly. And what I want you to see is that this man's sight was healed gradually. And it meant, it's meant to show the disciples and us that men, they were like this blind man. They had partial sight, but they needed more. And maybe that's you today. Some of you are more susceptible than others. If you've grown up in the church and you're so used to it, maybe this is you, that you see Jesus, but you're not like enthralled by Jesus. Like you see Jesus, but you're not amazed by his gospel. You see Jesus, but you you don't feel the joy and you're not compelled by the gospel. Maybe you come here and you see people worshiping. They got their hands up in the air. They seem like they have so much joy. Maybe you're in a connection group and you just hear stories of people like leveraging their life. They're, they're throwing off sin. They're living in a way that you're like, why would they do this? You hear stories about how they, they're taking people into their house. They're giving away money. They gave someone their car. And you're just like, what is going on with these people? You don't quite get it. Maybe you're kind of like this blind man that you see Jesus, but you don't really see him. If you're not enthralled by Jesus and amazed by his gospel, I love that you're here. Guys, I'd encourage you, ask God to open your eyes. This is a prayer that he would love to answer. Just be like, Jesus, help me to see. Let me to see your goodness. Let me be amazed by you. Let me see your glory. Open my eyes. Soften my heart. Do that today. Ask him to help you see. But from here, Jesus is basically going to become like kind of like the ultimate spiritual optometrist, okay? He's going to give his disciples like an eye exam and going to help them to see with 2020 vision. And here in chapter 8, Jesus is going to help us to see four things that are necessary for God saving and us living. And the first thing we see through this passage, is that God wants to help us to see this. We need to see Jesus for who he is. All right, look at verse 27. And Jesus went on with the disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to not tell anyone about him. Okay, so after Jesus heals this blind man, he takes his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi, which was a a little town that was about 25 miles away from Bethsaida. And what Jesus does here is interesting, okay? Because in this time, most rabbinic schools and most rabbis, what they would do is they wouldn't ask questions of their disciples. But the tradition was that the disciples, the students, would come to the rabbis with questions, and the rabbis would just sit there as very wise men, and then when they got a question, they would field it. But Jesus is unlike any rabbi, unlike any teacher, and he flips the script here. And he starts asking the questions. And the first question, if you look back, is he asks, he's like, what are people saying? Right? Like, you've been around the crowds. Like, what are people talking about? Who do they think that I am? 
And he's talking about the uncommitted crowds that we've been seeing. The people that are just amazed at Jesus' power and his miracles, but they can't really wrap their head around that he is the Messiah. He's saying, what are they saying about me? And let me just tell you this, guys. If you're newer to Christianity, if you're newer to the church, if you're newer to the Bible, you need to understand that this is the ultimate question. Who is Jesus? This is the most important question. Don't ask questions if you're newer to the church in terms of like, well, what do I have to wear to fit in with these people? Like, can I still cuss in this building? Or am I gonna catch on fire? Can I smoke on this in the parking lot? Like, what? Don't ask, who cares about those questions? This is the question. Who is Jesus? The most important question. And the disciples, they reply back with all the current theories of the time. And what they reveal in their answers is that the average person that's hanging around Jesus and watching Jesus do all these miracles, they're like, man, he's pretty amazing. He's a great illusionist. He's got power. Like, he's, he's great. They were impressed by him, but they didn't have the slightest idea that he was God, the Messiah. And so he turns his next question more personal. And in verse 29, he says, okay, that's great. You know what everybody's saying about me, but who do you say that I am? Jesus, with this question, cuts to the crux of the matter. And nothing was important, as important as the way that they answered this question. Who do you say that I am? And again, I'll pause. This is the most significant question that you will ever answer. You will be answered, or you will be asked like hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of questions. Dads, you get that in one day, right, with your kids, right? But you will be asked a ton of questions throughout your life. But there's nothing like this question because eternity hangs on it. However you answer this question, eternity will be determined. And while the crowds got it wrong, which guys, if you just sit back and think about this situation, like the crowds got it wrong. They missed Jesus. They missed the Savior who came to save them from their sin because they were too proud and they wanted to go their own way and they missed out on salvation. It's incredibly sad when you read the Bible like this. But Peter, he kind of speaks up for all the disciples here and he got it right and in verse 29 he says, you are the Christ. And while Peter oftentimes just like puts his foot in his mouth and says stupid stuff all the time, he actually does a good job here, okay? But I want you to look at the way that Matthew 16, 16 puts it. He he captures, Matthew captures the full statement and preserves the full statement of what Peter says. But take a look. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And I want you to know, Doxa, that this is the only acceptable answer to who Jesus is. Because when Peter says you are the Christ, because he didn't just give Peter, or Jesus like another name, all right? It's not like Jesus is his first name and Peter gave him a last name, okay? Because it's, it's like this, it's Jesus literally means God our Savior. And Christ is not actually a name, but it's a title. It means anointed or special or chosen. In Hebrew, it's the, it's the title Messiah. And I want you to see something. If you look back to verse 29, this is so significant of what Peter says. Peter doesn't just say, you're a anointed one, okay? He says emphatically, you are the anointed one. And so Peter is saying, you are the king, you are the only God, you are the only savior. Peter's saying, you are the promised anointed one of God, prophesied from the very beginning, from the third book or third chapter of Genesis, the promised son who's going to come to save his people from their sin. And in this moment, guys, the disciples, they're seeing clearly. They're seeing clearly. And Mark because he just kind of gets to the point and just kind of just says immediately and just kind of runs through it real quick. He doesn't report Jesus kind of like expressing any amount of emotions or joy. But if we look back at at Matthew's account, in Matthew 16, I'll read it to you. Here's what Jesus says. He says, blessed are you, Peter. Because of this confession, Jesus says, blessed are you. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, and listen to this, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
God opens up Peter's eyes. He truly sees Jesus, which caused him to believe, and then he says that this confession is what will uphold the church. Now, Doxa, understand this about the church. The church will stand strong and the church will move forward if it remains committed to the confession and the preaching that Jesus is the Christ. It's not music, it's not building, it's not activities, it's not volunteering, it's not giving away money, it's all about Jesus. The minute the church starts replacing Jesus with ministries and activities is the minute that the church becomes impotent and irrelevant. It's all Jesus, it's always Jesus. If you come around Doxa, we talk about Jesus a lot. There's over under bets every weekend of how many times I'm gonna say Jesus, okay? We say it a lot because it's all about him. He is the Christ. And I need you to understand that your confession concerning Jesus Christ is a matter of life and death. It really is. Jesus is not neutral. And so I'll have, I ask you, like, where are you? Where are you at in terms of Jesus? Like, are you part of, like, kind of like the, the uncommitted crowd that is just missing Jesus? Or are you seeing Jesus and listening to Jesus and watching all that he does and leaning into Jesus in faith, holding the confession that he is the Christ? Because you just need to understand that confession is the only hope for broken, sinful people like me and like you. That confession is the only thing that yields salvation and joy and forgiveness that church will not take care of your sin problem. Giving away money will not take care of your sin problem. Being a really good dad will not take care of your sin problem, it's only Jesus. And so we all need Jesus and Peter's confession needs to be our confession if we want forgiveness and salvation. And here's what I love about Peter and the disciples here that makes it extremely relevant, especially as we live in Madison, Wisconsin, okay? Peter and the disciples, they rejected the prevailing opinions and the pressure of the crowd and the culture about Jesus. You see that? They knew about everything that everybody was saying, and they were the few that kind of were just holding on to know he is the Christ. And Docs, I'll tell you, for your eternity and your salvation, this is what you need to do. See, popular trends about the identity of Jesus must always surrender to the words of Scripture. They have to. There's always gonna be something that somebody says about who Jesus is and what this book is. And there's gonna be smart people that have a bunch of letters after their name that come up with new theories and sell how antiquated this book is and that Jesus really isn't the Christ, but he's somebody else. And we just need to understand that we need to humbly but readily reject that. Humbly. And maybe, guys, I'll say this, maybe you're here and you're more skeptical as you open up the Bible. I love that you're here. I was in that place like 16 years ago. If you do come more skeptically to the Bible and you're saying, okay, I hear what you're saying, but how are you so sure? Like what can give, like how do you know like Peter's confession is the one that we need to follow and that's that big of a deal? And here's what I thought, I'm not gonna get into this a ton. It's the resurrection. Jesus is the only one in the history of the world who said that he would be killed but then three days later he would come back from the dead. And when you look at history, when you look at circumstantial evidence outside of the Bible and even biblical texts, there is a lot of evidence, an overwhelming majority of evidence that points you to Jesus rose from the dead. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he validated and he vindicated everything he said about his identity as God. And it also validated and vindicated all that he said about this book being the very words of God to us. And so it's the resurrection that gives us certainty of this. And it helps us to see Jesus who he is. And if you know Jesus as the Christ, just like Peter, you are blessed. Now, guys, with Peter's great confession of Jesus, that he is in fact the Christ, the disciples, they, they finally grasp Jesus' identity, but they're missing it. All right, they're not seeing fully. 
that they understood that Jesus was the Messiah, but they had a very malnourished understanding of what the Messiah would actually do. And so Jesus breaches another subject with them, and he tells them what the Messiah is going to do, what he is going to do. And the second thing that God is helping us to see here in Mark 8 is he's helping us to see Jesus' mission. All right? Jesus' mission as the Christ. Look at verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. I want you to circle must in your Bible. Big word. Must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. So Jesus is not speaking in parables and in stories, but he's just saying it plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And so what we see, guys, is that Peter and the disciples, they they truly saw Jesus as he really is. God, Messiah, King, Savior, but they still didn't understand what he came to do. Because Jesus says here that he is in fact king, but that he is a king who came to die. And a king who dies is not what the disciples expected or wanted, but it is, however, what they desperately needed. And if you look back to verse 31, Jesus uses the word must. He says he must suffer. He must be rejected. He must die. He must rise. That Jesus, he wasn't looking down the line and he said, man, if I keep acting like this, if I keep like ticking off all the religious leaders by saying I'm God, they might kill me. I might suffer. No, Jesus is speaking with certainty. And he says, these things have to happen if I'm going to fulfill my mission. Now, again, we love to ask questions, right? So we'll ask another question. Why did Jesus use this language of necessity? I mean, Why? Why did it have to happen? Here's what you need to know. Guys, Jesus spoke in these terms because from the foundation of the world, with the first of humanity, God determined that the Son would suffer, be rejected, be killed, and be raised to redeem, forgive, and save the people that he created in love for the wrath of God is coming for sin. This is the gospel We always talk about how every book and every page of the Bible is about Jesus and it's about the gospel. We see the gospel right here. And I need you to see this. Guys, when you look around the world, you know, and you see the brokenness, you feel the brokenness, families fall apart, you're sad, you see just atrocities, injustice, all that happening. We can sit there and think, man, it's because we have terrible politicians. Amen, right? But you just gotta take a shot at politicians anytime you can, okay? But you know, it could be because we got terrible leaders. Terrible people in power. Guys, that might play a role, but I need you to understand all of that is a result of sin. Sin is the biggest problem in our life, and this is why Jesus says, I have had to come. I have to die. I have to rise. And sin is just anything that God is not. And we all sin. We don't do things that we should, and we do things that we shouldn't do. The Bible calls this sin. In the way that sin came into the human experience and the effects of sin, we see in the book of Genesis, the book of origins, that God, he created everything that we see. And then he created humanity, the pinnacle of his creation that he loves in his image. And we were here. This was humanity. And then humanity did their own thing, disobeyed, went their own way, and this separated us from God. This is what sin does. It separates us from God. It separates us from each other. And this is where every single person exists in this world, apart from forgiveness and redemption from God. And humanity tried so many different things. We're going to kill a bunch of animals. We're going to celebrate a bunch of feasts. We're going to follow a bunch of rules. And God is like, there is nothing you can do to close that gap. And some of you in here tirelessly try to close that gap with God. And that is why you're here. You're looking for a fulfillment that you can only find in Jesus because Jesus, at the perfect time in the fulfillment of prophecy, he steps into human history and he lives and he dies and he raises and on the cross, as he's dying, he does so for our sin. And when we come to him in faith, he takes our sin, he gives us his righteousness and he brings us back to God. This is the gospel. And this is why Jesus said he must die. He must suffer. He must rise because there is no other way for us 
to be with God forever and escape the consequences of sin, which is just hell. He came to give us a way out. But the disciples, they weren't expecting this. All right, they were expecting Jesus, the Messiah, would come and they would, he would present himself as Israel's king. He would conquer Israel's armies or enemies. He would right all that is wrong. He would set people free and he would establish a kingdom of peace. And they were so close. They were so close, but they missed it. And the Jews of the day and today still just miss it. They, don't, they didn't understand how this would happen. They missed out on the Old Testament prophecies from Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and other different places that talk about he will in fact do this, but he will do it by suffering and dying. And this is what we all need. Because Hebrews 9.22 says that there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And we need Jesus. And so Jesus is teaching them plainly what they need to see and what they most need need, but they didn't understand. And so Peter gets up and he rebukes Jesus. Okay. And I need you to understand this isn't Peter being like, ah, oh, Jesus, I didn't agree with that. The rebuke, it's a strong rebuke. Peter hears Jesus say, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise. And Peter says, no, you're not. I won't allow it. Not on my watch. I am Peter. You're not going to do it. You're not going to die. I have a plan for you. And so I'm not going to let you die. And Jesus looks at the disciples and he realizes that if the disciples start to think that this can actually happen, they're gonna fall into some false teaching and miss Jesus even more. And so Jesus looks back at Peter and he rebukes him. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Now, guys, here's what's going on. Peter, or Jesus treats Peter as if he were Satan or a demon-possessed man. And this is harsh, but it's justified and necessarily because in this moment, if you remember back to Matthew chapter four with the temptation of Jesus in the desert, Peter offers Jesus the same thing as Satan did. The crown without the cross. That Peter thinks he's got a better plan than God does. I mean, to say it plainly, Peter wants Jesus to fit into his personal agenda. Peter thinks he knows the kind of Jesus that he needs, and he attempts to reshape, redefine Jesus and his mission. And guys, again, if we just pause and think about this, I think we're guilty of the same thing so often. I mean, so often we say, give me a Jesus that I can control. Give me a Jesus that I can put my words in his mouth. Give me a Jesus that doesn't ask me to change my plans. Give me a Jesus that doesn't ask, ask me to change my lifestyle and my desires. Give me a Jesus that I can control and kind of put in my pocket and that's the Jesus I wanna follow because that Jesus doesn't cost me anything. But Doxa, this is not the way it is. Jesus doesn't fit into our story. We fit into Jesus' story. And you and I need to learn and affirm and accept the words and the ways of God, not man. We all have ways about doing stuff. And we might have times where we don't understand it fully and it's really, really difficult to follow Jesus because it's just contrary to what we think we should do and what we want to do. I use this idea of uh, Isaiah 55 all the time. Like we have thoughts and we have ways about life. Like we think about our money, we think about our lifestyle, we think about our sex life, we think about everything. And we all have thoughts and ways about how we want all that to shape out. Isaiah 50 says, 55 says, you do have thoughts and ways, but God says my thoughts and my ways are actually higher and better than yours. And so because Jesus is God and we are not, we just submit our thoughts and our ways to him and just say, help me and teach me so I can live for your glory and my good. And so Jesus helps his disciples to see his identity, his mission, and the third thing is this, is Jesus helps us to see what it means to follow him. Look at verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? He's teaching his disciples not just the gospel, but what it looks like to actually follow him. 
And as Jesus lays this out, guys, I want you to know that this is the normal Christian life. This is the basics of discipleship. But sadly, in our world today, when we see people live like this, we think like super Christian. We think like radical Christian. But this is just normal. That being a follower of Jesus requires three essentials. And he lists them out here. First, he says to deny yourself. All right, and what this means is really just to give up your sense of like self-determination and self-righteousness. It's to live as Jesus said and did. It's to treasure and value Jesus and love Jesus more than yourself. It's really just to kind of put to death the idol of I. It's not to just care about us. It's to look to Jesus and to follow him even when we might disagree in our flesh. We, it's, us, it's us saying, you are God and I am not. Help me, because I want to do my own thing, but I will follow you. Jesus says, deny yourself. Secondarily, if you look back, he says, take up your cross. And to simply put it, guys, what this means, this means to die. Cross was a symbol of torture and execution. It was death. And I know in the midst of, like, prosperity gospel preaching that we hear so often in our world today, many people think that the Christian life is all about, like, living life to the fullest and having the fullest joy and ha- being ri- happy and healthy and wealthy and all of this stuff. I need you to understand the great paradox of the Christian faith is no one actually lives until they've mastered the art of dying. It's dying to self, it's dying to sin, it's dying to perversion. And it's following Jesus. It's taking up our cross. And this is hard because we don't want to die. It hurts to die. And so when we come across like our passions and our flesh and we're like, this is real, to put that to death and to say no so we can follow Jesus, that's hard. That's tough. And then thirdly, Jesus says, follow me. And here's the question I'd ask you. Like, are you willing to obey Jesus? This is what following Jesus is about. It's, it's about obeying him. It's about listening to his words and looking at his life and modeling ours after him. Are you willing to obey Jesus? Talk about this in your connection group. And if the answer is, is no, and maybe, maybe the answer is no because you're like, I want to, but I just can't. <laughs> Ask people to help you and pray for you. And maybe you're like, no, because I, I don't want to. <laughs> That's a different, that's a hard heart. And maybe you just ask them to pray that you would see Jesus. We follow him. And we hear the words of 1 John 2, 6 that says, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Talk about this in your group. So Jesus is saying, and this is the whole point of verses 35 through 37, that when you deny yourself, you actually find your real self because all the other ways that we can run our lives is really just dead ends. And if you've ever been down dead ends in life, you know that it's not fun to hit that wall. And Jesus is trying to help us, and I'm trying to help you. It's Jesus. And so he helps us to see who he truly is, what he came to do, what it looks like to follow him, and the last thing today, Jesus is wanting us to see the results of rejecting him. All right, look at verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Doxa, I need you to see this as a warning. It's a warning that Jesus desperately wants us to hear and see so we can ultimately avoid it. That in this context, ashamed means like to despise, to reject, or just to refuse to accept. And so, To be ashamed of Jesus is to be unwilling to come to Jesus in faith and to allow his words, his works, and his ways affect our lives in any way. And this is so important because I need you to understand the only people who will be saved from sin, death, and hell are those people who are ashamed of themselves and not ashamed of Jesus. And he gives us a warning like this because he loves you. Do you know that? Like he loves you. And he doesn't want you to miss out on salvation in eternity with him. Because guys, the truth is, is one day, 
Jesus will come back and he will come back as judge to put an end to Satan, sin, death, and hell. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And if we bow with faith in our heart, this will be the best day of your life because he will usher you into the kingdom of God where there will be no sin, no suffering, no tears. It will be just joy and perfection because Jesus is yours and you're his. But if he comes back and you do not know him, this is gonna be the worst day of your life because there will be no salvation. There will only be condemnation and damnation. We need Jesus and I need you to know that Jesus is sharing this not because he wants to yell at you and he, we're not, I, I know sometimes when I talk about hell, people are like, dude, Rob, don't talk about hell, like that's scary. Guys, it's supposed to be scary so you don't wanna go there. And we love you enough to tell you the truth about eternity. And God, he loves you. That's why you're here. He loves you. Jesus loves you. I, sh I sing that song to my kids every single night when I tuck them to bed. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Did that last night with Lily. We were having a worship set in her bedroom, and it was amazing. And I need you to understand, Jesus loves you. Come to Jesus. You need him. And so let me just give you two things by way of application, okay, that I think captures the substance of this passage, okay? The first is this. Be careful about the words you listen to. Be careful about the words you listen to. Guys, we live in a world where we're constantly bombarded by differing thoughts and words on everything from entertainment to morality, from politics to religion, and there's no shortage of words and opinions about who Jesus is and what Jesus has said. And like Peter, we need to have a clear understanding of Jesus and eternal life and his word because we are gonna be constantly hit with things and ideas and words that will try and tear us away from the truth of God. Because don't let anyone nullify the print on the page of scripture with differing reasons and philosophies and all of those things, but we need to be Bible saturated. And so do the work of Philippians where Paul says, whatever is good and pleasing, fill your mind with those things, things of God, so that we don't have the junk floating in and all of a sudden derail our faith. So be careful about the words that you listen to and secondarily, guys, release the worldly things that you're clinging to. Peter had a clear picture of what he wanted Jesus to do but it didn't line up with God's plan. And unlike Peter, we need to let go of our worldly ideas in ways that don't line up with God's ways. And every single one of us, including myself, we all have our own list of worldly things that tend to crowd out Jesus in our life. There are things that we spend our money and our time on. There are things that we talk about or worry about. There are things that are maybe like attitudes and actions and addictions and different things. Whatever that is in your life, we all have it. Identify those and rid yourself, release yourself from those things. And so, guys, this is what we're gonna do to end, okay? We're gonna actually spend some time praying together. Before we sing, we're gonna pray. And I know if you're newer to church and you're like, this was awkward enough, I had to listen to you, but now you're gonna make me pray. Here's where I'm at. We don't want you just to learn to hear from God. We want to teach you to talk to God. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is simply communication and communion with God. And so I wanna help you to understand how you can talk to God and how this is not just a book that we read, but this can be a book that we pray. Because this is how we go deep with Jesus. This is how we open up our eyes and see Jesus. It's by hearing and talking to him. And so we're gonna pray together. There's gonna be a passage that pops up here on the screen, Hebrews chapter 12. And this is what it says. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, these are departed saints, Christians who have died, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we're just gonna spend the next five or so minutes praying and just talking to God. And so whatever you wanna do, if you wanna sit, 
close your eyes. You can do that. Believe it or not, you don't have to close your eyes, guys. God, God can still hear you when your eyes are open. You can even drink your coffee while you pray. It's amazing, okay? But we're just going to talk to God. And I'm just going to lead you through this. And we're going to talk to the Father. So he starts off. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. As you talk to God, search your heart. What is it in your life right now that's ensnaring you? What is it that is keeping you from fully experiencing God right now? Just name it. Is it anger and bitterness that's just overtaken you? And you can't even feel the joy of the Lord anymore because you're so angry. Is it an addiction? Is there something that started off as a small little weed, but now it's just this giant bush that is just wrapping itself around your life and it feels like you can't get out? Is it insecurity? Just talk to him, name it. And as you're sitting there thinking about those things, don't feel shame, but lay it down. Lay it down at the foot of Jesus and hear the voice of Jesus say, forgiven. And maybe it's one of those things that you just feel like you can't lay down right now. That it's got a choke hold on you. Talk to God and just say, help me lay it down. I'm not strong enough, but you are. Help me lay it down. Just ask him. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Just look at Jesus right now. Remind yourself of the gospel. See Jesus living for you. See Jesus marching to the cross for you. See Jesus on the cross where it's your sin that is holding him there. And then hear Jesus, hear him just speak, Father, forgive them. And just thank him for his goodness and his gospel. and ask him as you just walk through life to help you just to fix your eyes on him every single day. There's distractions, there's temptations, there's sin, there's people that can just take your eyes off of Jesus. Ask him just to help you to constantly look at him. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Just thank him. Ask him to help you to see his sacrifice. 
Ask him to open up your eyes that you would just be enthralled by him, that you'd be amazed by his gospel. Jesus, we love you. Would you help us to be people that would not just hear these words, but actually live like that. That we would see you and we would keep our eyes locked on you all the days of our life. And that you would keep us holy and set apart, that you would keep us from sin and that you would use us for your glory and the good of the people around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.